We are back. So, episode two. What's up, Mike? Nothing. Nothing. It's Friday afternoon, Saturday morning for you. The uh, the beauty of a nice globe, right? A nice uh, spherical Earth is that it's a different time for you than it is for me because the Earth is not flat. So let's just. If you're a flat earther, turn this off. Let's just just get that right out of the way. We do not want your support if you're a flat earther. That's good. Yeah, no, I'm on board. It's actually uh, the 25th of April here today, so 24th for you. Um, 25th of April on the Australian calendar is actually uh, a pretty special day. So it's um, it's Anzac Day. Uh, This is a Anzac Day. Yeah. So this is um, Australia and New Zealand Army Corps. So this is a day just over a hundred years ago where Australian and New Zealand soldiers landed on Gallipoli um, in Turkey. And uh, it was a a huge, huge loss of life in that campaign. And there was a lot of brave soldiers and uh, a lot of them didn't come home. Um, So it's a commemorative day um, for them, but also for everyone else that served in uh in the australian new zealand forces since then so it's um it's quite a special day for australians where there's a lot of reflection and a lot of remembering um i didn't serve myself but my my grandfather did in the second world war so we think of him and and a lot of other people and just be uh be appreciative and grateful um and i think this is potentially the first time that um we haven't been able to i guess celebrate that day or you know at least spend that day in remembrance in groups and with um with parades that happen and and things like that so it is a bit different um but hey this is our this is our brave new world so uh yeah it is a little bit of a solemn day but uh it's a it's a nice day as well we sort of just appreciate everything that people have done for us and it's a it's a nice way to to keep the memory alive yeah, no, shoot. Well, uh, happy a- Azac Day. Anzac Day, or, yeah, that's it. Anzac Day, Anzac Day. Happy Anzac Day. Thank you for your grandfather for his service. We kicked those assholes' ass back in World War II, so he can, uh, he can, he can. Sleep yeah. Ass. So Very if anyone's shape. watching, if anyone watches this down the track, we uh, we say thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for your service, Australian American. Uh, any service in the uh, in the face of good and what's right in this world. Absolutely. So what's been going on, man? What's happened this week? Nothing. Still still stuck in quarantine here in the city. Uh, I guess the curve has been leveled, so to speak, but nobody knows what the heck to do next. We have no clue. We don't know if this thing's going to mutate. Well, we know it's going to mutate. We don't know the degree in which it's going to mutate. Um, do we have to wait for a vaccine? Do we have to wait for an antiviral treatment? What's going on? You know, the, the Spanish flu, right? 1918. I don't know if you guys had that over there in Australia. Yeah. It was a pandemic. So I'm assuming so. Um, they had that, that kind of double, double, uh, peak pattern to it. So I guess right. everybody's trying to sort out how to not have a double peak pattern. So we're just, it's a waiting game. It's frustrating. So. How's your week going? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a similar story here, except we've seemed to have done quite well in general in Australia. So we're quite lucky in the sense that uh, we're an island nation. So once we close the borders, there's no one coming in. Um, So then if we can deal with it internally, um, then we're in a good place. And that seems to seems to be what's happening. So the new the new cases each day are very low levels now. Um, the chat is starting to come out now about how do we start moving forward and how do we start easing some restrictions and, and charting a plan to, to get out of this. Um, so we'll see, uh, no one really knows what's going to happen. And, you know, as you mentioned, we might get hit with another wave or something like that. So I think everyone's still very much on guard and on edge about it, but, um, there's, it seems to be more optimism this week. So that's been nice yeah a little bit less uh less um you know solemn solemn weight in the air yeah how's the weather down there 
it's it's good. Yeah, it's starting to turn a little bit. It's getting a little bit cold. We're heading into winter, which is a little bit of a, a problem potentially with uh, with all of this going on. Um, I think psychologically, people are going to start getting colds and flus, and so we won't actually. You know, there'll be a lot of questions. Oh my God, do I have coronavirus and and whatnot? Um, but uh, yeah, it's beautiful, man. The sun's still out, and I love this time of year. It's really nice. And, sort of in that transition zone yet yet more proof that uh the earth is spherical it's right winter. it's about to be winter for you it's about to be summer for me yeah i don't know those uh the flat earth guys are off their heads i don't know what they're talking about so i'm i'm sure that there is some i don't know it's one of those things where i guess i've got the time i should go down like a flat earth youtube hole and see what i can find out like let me just suspend reason for a minute and see if there's anything uh anything worth um you know worth looking into like maybe i'll come back next week and i'm like dude chris you don't believe this but the earth is flat and let me show you all these youtube videos that let you know how it's going to be that's episode three the earth is flat there's some pretty crazy uh conspiracy theories out there for just about everything there's even a lot floating around about this pandemic that it's um it's man-made and it's planned and all this stuff so i mean and there's convincing arguments for all of this shit so convincing yeah. arguments yeah yeah the thing about the internet is it just it's this thing where you, there's always going to be enough people that agree with you it just depended on your on, on the scope of the individuals that you're in contact with, right? So if you're, you know, in, in small town suburban Sydney and you had this crazy flipping idea, you know, maybe there was only fifty thousand people that you could come into contact with, and of those fifty thousand people, you know, maybe one percent agree with you. They're like, man, this is man made. Those those son of a guns over there. But the internet just blows the scope of things out so you're always yeah. going to find somebody that agrees with you and you get these like weird support groups i forget somebody i forget it was a comedian who was talking about it and he's like it's just the internet's a weird place because you know if you like to and, and diapers around the house and you're looking for other people to dress up and wear diapers around the house you would never yeah. find that in a small town like new york City, there's probably like a like a meetup.com group for that but outside yeah. of that like you were screwed if you were in iowa which is like a very rural part of the united states in the midwest but the internet man you, there's probably a million people out there that love to wear diapers around the house and and you can find them on reddit so it's just <laughs> it, it's an amplifier it just magnifies everything the internet crazy shit man yeah, and you know, the other thing is you can just ignore what you don't want to believe or you can just ignore the stuff that flies in the face of anything. So you, you can really just pick and choose what you want to look at. Um, yeah, and you, and you have to learn to pick out the quality sources versus the sources that, that aren't quality. And correct. that brings me really nicely to my next point, which is a study that you brought up to me earlier in the week where it just basically academically validated the fact that bald men are just way better in every sense yeah. of the word and just have, we're more aggressive we're more assertive people think we're more dangerous women want to be with us men want to be us or men want to be with us women want to be us whatever you know it's 2020 and uh that's a beautiful thing it's just it, it it validated all the feelings that I had about myself. You know, it was, uh, it was it was great to see. It was a great find for you. You were probably digging hours and hours into many academic journals to find it. Man, I'm glad you did. Well, you know, it actually wasn't that hard to find because it's just the truth. So, uh, and you know, it is scientific research. It says that in the title, uh, and it was conducted at a university. So straight away, it's got massive credibility. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, what do you say? I didn't actually read this in the research, but I have heard anecdotally that often um, men in our position have lost their hair because they have excess testosterone or high levels of testosterone, which I think we can just infer that that would also mean that we are superior lovers. So that's, that's 100%. 
I think there's there's just so many upsides. <laughs> We'll have her come in and just confirm scale of one to 10. We'll see what she says, but no, it is, it's a, it's a local conversion of testosterone into, into, to DHT, which is um, basically a more potent version of testosterone that happens at the actual hair follicle level. And it's just so strong that the hair follicle can't, can't stand it. It's like, screw this. I, I, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting plummeted by this super strong testosterone. I'm dead. And it just dies off. And so that's where, from a functional standpoint, and this is actually a really good point, you go into a lot of, uh, of what the hair loss treatment is from a pharmaceutical standpoint, you understand that it's, a, it's an androgenic blocker. So it's trying to block the level of testosterone in your body with the hopes that it will then decrease the amount of conversion from testosterone to DHT, therefore decreasing the amount of hair follicles that you will lose so i believe in the study one of the key one of the key factors that they determined was that men who were balding were not rated as um aggressive and masculine and sexually desirable as the men that had already that had taken the matters into their own hands and just and just shaved it so you have the actual I guess, biochemical part of it saying, it's like, if I'm trying to keep this and taking pharmaceuticals to try and keep this, it's literally blocking my testosterone. And then you obviously go into a confidence standpoint and, and you know, how confident are you in your own skin to where you can say, ah, oh, fuck this, that's done. I'm just going to shave this off because this is who I am. This is me. And I'm going to get really, really good at looking bald. In my case at 26 years old, I was like, screw this. It's off. Now I got a head start because in 30 years, 65% of the people are going to be bald and I'm going to have way better practice at being bald than you. So it, it's, I don't know. And, and when, and you can look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, it's like, it was a, you know, the greatest and biggest and most powerful empire in the entire planet, right? The Roman empire being bald, male pattern baldness was actually a desirable characteristic. That's what it was literally bred. If you're a woman and you saw somebody with a big old horseshoe on their head, you were like, damn need me a piece of that and that's what happened and now all of a sudden you've got this trait that has just propagated over the course of thousands and, and, and thousands of years and then obviously you have certain things like wigs that you know impacted it but yeah blame the italians blame the romans it's a beautiful thing you know <laughs> and you know how many uh how many prominent men are in this position now you know if you think about the the leading men in hollywood over the years and that sort of thing we've got you know the rock is is there right now just crushing it um and you know a personal hero of mine over the years would happen with bruce willis you know he, he sort of held back as long as he could and then one day he just went fuck this shaved his head and you know john mcclain's just out there kicking ass killing bad guys and uh and getting married to Demi Moore when she was at the peak of her powers, and you know, yeah, peak she was Demi Moore. Some and Demi Moore is still smoking. I'd still take a run at Demi Moore, but Dude, uh, that um, that movie that she did, uh, Striptease, I think is one of the great um, Hollywood films. I know it got panned by the critics, but I thought it was a, an excellent story, and it had excellent dancing in it, so I really enjoyed it. Wonderful cinematography too. Yeah. Really. So, <laughs> the box was just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, that's it. So what we want to do outside of prove to everybody that two bald bastards are the best kind of bastards is the second principle, right? And we went over right. the first principle, which was load versus capacity, and, and we went out um, with the intention with this, I guess, video series of, of going in order, you know, one through seven, you know, what are the first or what are the principles? And, and again, these principles are, are truths that cannot be reduced anymore. They are accepted as facts and it, they're not up for debate. 
And the second that you can realize that they're not up for debate, you've all of a sudden built your, your, your baseline, your foundation to actually being a quality physician. And it's particularly important if you do have hair on your head and you don't have the assertiveness and the aggressiveness and the confidence to, uh, to succeed at this job. So if you've got hair, listen closely. Right on. And so we're really talking about the, uh, the application of these first principles, I suppose, which is the second principle. So we started with uh, load versus capacity, which is kind of the, at the base of the pyramid. So when your load exceeds your capacity, um, that brings us into pathology or it brings whatever that tissue that is that has had its capacity exceeded by load, it has then a pathology state. Um, so if it's not in health, it's in disease. And uh, so that's what we'll, we'll cover off on a little bit. Um, so essentially, we've got lots of different types of pathology that can, can happen. And um, it's our job to recognise that that exists and then start figuring out what that tissue is and what the state of it is and, and start working our plan forward from there. So, um, you know, this can be a very, a very long list um, depending on how far you go. But I guess within our scope and within the things that we're responsible for more often than not, the list isn't really all that exhaustive. Um, and then there's going to be a very common, common set of things in there that, that we see more often than not. So um, I guess one of the really key pathologies that probably sets apart the things that we do for people a lot of the time uh, that we should talk about is adhesion. Um, this is a very, very common pathology within the body, perhaps not commonly recognised and treated as much as it should be, um, but it's a big deal. So do you want to lead off on that and let's, um, let's get into what adhesion is and, and why it's such yeah. a big deal? Yeah, it is. It's the most common underdiagnosed treatable musculoskeletal pathology. You know, I won't even say it's just in the human body because I'm sure other animals have it as well. But when you look at the scope or the magnitude of your load versus capacity, that's how you can you can kind of get a good idea of the type of pathology that, that you will see. So magnitude is going to be two things, right? The, the degree, the intensity of the the load versus the capacity. So, you know, how big of a difference is your load versus your capacity um, and then time, right? So you have to kind of take those two considerations and, and, and based on that, you can start to determine, you know, what might be the, the list of pathologies that you have. So if you have an individual that's 60 years old, you know, they've got a large, large time component to that load versus capacity. And so I'm thinking of different things than if somebody who is a 18 year old baseball player who's, you know, pitched every weekend for, you know, 10 years, I'm thinking of a different pathology list. So for me, it, adhesion is on the it's serious. It's, it's very serious. It's on the milder side of the actual pathologies, right? It's like the body's first um, mechanism to to try and to try and I guess support a joint that's capacity has been exceeded by its load. So if you look at something like a building, and I'm not an architect or an engineer or anything like that, you know what happens when the load of the building exceeds the capacity of the foundation? Well, you have to reinforce that foundation, and adhesion is kind of that that first step of reinforcement. It's a, you know, it's a thicker, it's a more tough uh, tissue compared to normal muscle tissue. Uh, it has less flexibility, which is actually what your body wants. Um, it's, it's, it's tough to break down. It doesn't go away easily, but it's less intense and, and less destructive over the, well, I wouldn't say less destructive. It, it, you have a better prognosis if you have adhesion versus say a joint tear or, or osteoarthritis. So you, if we're going to rank it, it adhesion is the first thing that shows up and you want to kind of intervene on it before the other things show up. 
so that, that, that's the number one most common pathology that we see. It's also the most fixable. It also yields the greatest uh, symptomatic and functional results for the patient. So it's super, super important to find, locate, and remove that. Yeah, and it's probably something that I think more people would be familiar with, with what this is in a sense, because the terminology gets thrown around and changes a bit. And, you know, ad adhesion... The, the word sort of implies things that are stuck together, adhered together. Um, and that's certainly the case because this, this tissue, um, this adhesion tissue can develop directly within other tissues. So it can develop directly within muscles and connective tissues, um, or it can just develop between structures and stick them together and stop them from moving independently of one another. Um, but the terminology is interesting because we're really talking about um, extra collagen uh, fibers that are laid down in response to some sort of stress, some sort of injury. So it's essentially like scar tissue, um, which is just a, another way of describing the same thing, really. Um, so, if, you know, we, we're all kind of familiar with what it's like to get a an injury, uh, a cut to the skin, for instance, and you get some healing that happens there. So you get some scarring across it. The body needs to try and repair that to make it stronger. Um, and you know, those and they are tough. Those areas are, are very strong, and you often get something that's uh, that stays there. And sometimes it stays there for a very, very long time. And um, the body's interesting because you kind of see that at the surface, but then often underneath, it's a bit like a an iceberg in some cases, depending on how far that that has gone into the body, but there's often a lot more of that underneath the surface and it's not necessarily something that's um, very clear to see um, when you first look at it. So um, you might, this, this adhesion that we talk about, it, it just really refers to, um, to that type of response where there's collagen that's laid down in response to some sort of an insult or injury or something that's happened. Uh, some sort of process, um, but it's essentially that, and and it can be referred to in different places as different things. So it's, uh, I guess, in that sense, it's a little bit misleading. But we're all sort of talking about the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I love the cut example because we can even again draw that back to the first principle, and then we can extrapolate that first principle over to the second principle. So if you you cut yourself, if you cut yourself with you know, a knife, the, low, the, the capacity of your skin has been exceeded by the energy and force of that knife. Doesn't take much, especially with a very, very sharp knife, but boom, all of a sudden you've created a condition where there is an insult to your derm and your body's response is to lay down, you know, collagenous tissue in order to heal that, right? Same thing, you know, I, you know, I play guitar. So same thing happens with your fingers as you start to play guitar are strings the constant load of the strings on your fingers exceed the capacity and your body's response is then to callous those fingers over right it's a good response it's, it's a beautiful response in many cases same thing when you're doing crossfit and you're doing pull-ups right you're developing that callus developing that callus so you got a callus you've got a scar you've got um you know musculoskeletal adhesions musculoskeletal scar tissue fibrous adhesions whatever you want it's your body universally responds to the low it's it's capacity being exceeded by load by laying down thicker more durable tissue yeah and this uh so this is a huge problem because once this gets into a healthy tissue it stops it being able to lengthen properly so um, it stops it being able to do its job essentially so if we're talking about muscles it becomes weaker because it can't engage all the fibers to contract properly it can't lengthen out and stretch properly uh, so it, it, in some cases it kind of just turns into a rubber band but you get this um, sort of a stretching effect and it's going to snap back again and you know th this plays out in so many different scenarios for people that are perhaps unaware that it's actually happening and um, so if you think about maybe taking a rubber band um, and you can you can grind on that you can rub it with a lacrosse ball you could jump on it and stamp on it and you're not really going to be able to impact that too much by compression and and 
you know, so that's a, I guess, a representation maybe of like getting a massage, for instance, where there's compressive forces. But if you take that rubber band and actually apply a really nice strong tension to it, at some point it's going to snap. Um, and so that's essentially what needs to happen with uh, with the adhesion tissues. So we need to be able to locate it, put it under the right amount of tension, and and get those fibers to snap. And and so you know that's why uh, sometimes these things just keep on coming back, and people go for massages and getting. Um, all sorts of tools and things that they might have at home and trying to rub out areas and they just don't necessarily change for the long run. So it's, um, it's a tension that's needed to change these things. And, and so that's what we, that's what we practice. That's what we do. Yeah. And it's, it's really difficult to do. It's not easy to remove that. And you get a lot of people, a lot of practitioners that would just rather deny the existence of it than invest and it's very expensive and it costs a lot of time to get good at removing it so first of all you you, you have to be able to understand where where it is so boom you have adhesion in your hamstring right how, how can you find that how can you feel it how can you identify it's there we're not even going down that, that rabbit ridiculously difficult in isolation so now you have that rubber band and we know that that rubber band is going to break when we have applied 10 pounds of force to it, whatever. We'll just, we'll make up a very arbitrary number. What happens when you put four pounds of force through it? Nothing. Six pounds, nothing. Eight pounds, nothing. 9.2 pounds, nothing pounds, nothing. 9.9 .9 pounds, nothing. 10, boom, finally snaps. What happens when you put 10.2 pounds into it? Now we're starting to involve a little bit of, there, there's collateral with other tissue. You're causing bruising in the patient things like that. So you have to be able to identify it and then you have to have the technical skills to burn. And then you have to have the technical skills on top of that to preserve your own body to the point where you can break it down for 20 years. It's easier to just say it doesn't exist. It is hard. I think it's um, kind of through me, I think a bit as well, because you, especially watching other people make it look easy um it's it's easy to look at that and go i can do that um until you actually feel the difference of um understanding where those tension points are and how to create those and and how to actually guide someone to to work with you to get there man it's a skill it really is and it changes from person to person once you've got hands on them as well um you know, different body types. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a lot harder than it looks. It's a lot harder than it looks, but it, geez, it's effective. <laughs> yeah, no, it's ridiculous. It, 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 it makes a lot of things sense than what we were taught. And it, there's such a hole in the market for people who are skilled enough to do it too because if you don't take care of the adhesion right you're going to then start to go down that continuum of pathologies and every pathology that we every step we take down that continuum you're encountering a pathology that's going to be it's going to require more time more money more invasive procedures to fix so it's our job to prevent surgeries right? It's our job to prevent debilitating lifelong arthritis in people. And it's a very important job. And it's something that, you know, I still wake up on mornings and I'm like, shit, like, I'm not fucking good enough to do this. You know, like I wake up sometimes in a panic. I go to bed in a panic because it's a big deal. And if I'm not going to do it, who's going to do it, right? I can't, I can't be like, man, I couldn't get your rec fem today. Let me just refer you to freaking Chris over in Sid. Like, that's not how it works. It's me. So it, it's, it's a big deal. It's a lot of responsibility and it's something that, you know, causes sleepless nights, but I love it and take pride in being able to perform that task at a high level. Yeah. And I think that's what, that's what makes it, special and it's what makes you special as a, a provider that does it because you 
you know, you, you do care about it and it, it is something that you think about when you, you're not at work, for instance, and, you know, you're a nerd for it and, uh, and your patients are lucky, basically. Yeah. Well, you're the, you're, you're the, probably the bigger nerd out of us. So your patients are luckier. Well, man, I think, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a beautiful thing when you, you have something that you're a little bit passionate about and, uh, when you find that because not everyone does. Um, and, and that's a huge hole in, in the personal, um, existence. I think when, when you don't necessarily have something that you, you find very fulfilling and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful that I, that I found that. And, uh, so you know, I think that what do they say that if you um, you love what you do, you'll you'll never work a day in your life. Uh, I don't know if that's completely true. I think there'll definitely be days where there's uh, feels like it's work, but um, man, it it's amazing to be able to you know just have these conversations with someone like yourself, where we kind of fall on the same page with a lot of this stuff. I think it's you know it's a very rich experience, so I, I really appreciate it too. Yeah, no, no problem, man. It's freaking my pleasure. What else would I be doing in quarantine? Even if I wasn't in quarantine, I'd still be having this conversation with you. But I always tell, I'm, I always tell people when you find something you love, it's not that you don't work a day. You don't feel like you work. You may not feel like you work a day uh, for the rest of your life, but you work every minute of every day for the rest of your life. Like I have to schedule breaks because. I'm not doing something. I'm thinking about the next thing that I should do. Okay. I've completed this task. What's the next thing to do? What's the next thing to do? So it's like you work your nuts off or ovaries off, excuse me, ladies. And um, it, you're just okay with it. You know, like you just develop, you, you don't have a choice. And then not having that choice, you become so comfortable experiencing the discomfort of it, experiencing the fear of it, that it, it, it just, that's it like you, you know what i mean like if somebody yeah. i don't know if you have if you have if you have kids and you're listening right now if somebody was like take a bullet for your kid you'd be like hmm, sure you wouldn't it would suck you'd be dead but you wouldn't think twice about it that's what it's like when you find what you like to do yeah i have trouble shutting it off sometimes actually and you know we've talked about that before with the the entrepreneurial type um and i didn't really know that about myself until a few years ago or even more recently but uh, you know, I've enjoyed that, but it has its challenges as well. Um, I think, uh, it, actually even just in this last week, you know, I ran into a little bit of imposter syndrome, um, somewhere between here and, and probably just doing our first episode. Uh, you know, I was watching it back. I was doing the edit and I thought it was, it was good. I enjoyed it. I, I was uh, something that that was a lot of fun and, but you know, I haven't been doing a lot of social media lately and I'm, I'm not really a, a social media guy. I don't wake up and kind of go, Oh, sweet. I'm excited to do some, some content today. It's, you know, it's something that I think is necessary. Right. But I think if I had the choice, it's just not really, I'm not a, a big uh, extroverted person. It's, it's just not really my thing. It's like eating uh, vegetables. Yeah. You just do it. <laughs> you just have to do it. <laughs> it sucks. You just have to eat fucking vegetables. <laughs> And, you know, so when you do this, you've got to get used to putting your, putting yourself out there, putting your personal thoughts out there and then being okay with um, the idea of other people judging that and criti being critical about that and, and forming opinions. And so I let that get to me a little bit. Uh, it jumped into my head and ran with it and I felt like, uh, I felt like an imposter and I started thinking who is, who is this bald dickhead and, you know, who what right does he have to talk about this and who's actually going to care? Um, and I, you know, I felt like that before and you just have to get over it. Um, so yeah, it, it happens and it, it's probably the biggest pitfall with, with doing this sort of thing. I think it's the internet, man. There's going to be somebody that agrees with you. Right. Right. We've already established the statistical likelihood that somebody's going to agree with you. Right. You're fine. Who cares? Who gives a flying who? I mean, it's, I don't know. You just, you fake it. You fake it. You pretend you're interesting and then you maybe be, you become interesting and, and that's it. I mean, I don't know. Today I didn't do Jack Squad. So I don't know. Like, what the heck do I? Today is a day. To, I feel it too. Today's a day. I feel it too. I did nothing. I woke up. I did an hour of work. 
uh, I, like I made a half ass sandwich at noon and then I just fucking sat here and did things, tried to practice picking a lock and all this other stuff. And that was it. So it's like, I get done with a day like today and I'm like, who the hell do you think you are giving anybody any sort of actionable advice on health? You sat and did nothing. You didn't work out. You woke up. The first thing you did was you checked your phone. You tell people to do that, not do that all the time. So it's like, sometimes you just got to roll with it, man. Just believe. Yeah. Look, we're all humans. You know, everyone's, uh, Everyone's, everyone's got their challenges and no one's perfect. So, you know, we just roll with it. It's all good. So what happens then in, in the hypothetical situation that somebody on the off chance, and by off chance, I mean ridiculously high likelihood, develops adhesion and they don't get it taken care of right that you have adhesion that develops for you know you're talking anywhere from six months to five years what happens to to the body when 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 that occurs when you don't get it taken care of right what is that next step on the continuum of pathology that's less fixable from a conservative standpoint yeah it's not good um (laughs) it's <laughs> simply it's i mean yeah you, you you might be headed to surgery at at the worst you know you likely the joints are going to get worn out sooner than they should um you know so if we talk about the low back for instance and let's say that the the function of the low back has not been good for a long time it hasn't been able to bend as it should hasn't been able to flex those discs are going to be copying a beating over time um and so, you know, if we're talking about a principle being a respect for pathology, I think in treating that and not actually recognizing that and, and at least trying to correct it, um, then that's really a disrespect for pathology because there's, there's something there that's, that's not being dealt with. So, um, you know, if that goes on for long enough, those uh, structures in there, the discs and, uh, and the joints are going to wear out and, and we don't get those back. Um, so it's, a, it's a slippery slope once that happens. Um, you know, people, uh, we have to get 80, 90, a hundred, 110 years out of our, out of our spines. And, you know, when that starts to go bad after 30 years, it's, um, you know, I guess we don't really know yet what the rest of that picture looks like, but it's, uh, it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. It, it, nothing good happens when you don't get your adhesion removed and we can simplify it we can oversimplify it to the point where most people can understand it by saying the next step after adhesion in the progressive pathology degenerative continuum copyright uh you're looking at cartilage tears um cartilage pathologies whether it's a disc or a labrum or whatever. And then you're looking at bone pathologies when we start to develop um, osteoarthritis, degenerative joint syndrome, any, anything like that. So you, you basically have your adhesion as level one uh, and your bone and your cartilage becomes you know, level two. Um, and if you don't get the adhesion fixed, it's a ticking time bomb until level two happens. Now, the thing about level two is the intervention is likely surgical and the intervention is likely surgical in the case that it can be fixed, right? You can't, I mean, what do you, you can't go in and, you know, necessarily get mild degenerative disc disease fixed in the low back pain at, at 50 years old. You know, there are times when orthopedic surgeons won't touch your hip labrum room because it's, it's not bad enough and they just have to wait for it to progress to get worse. There's not a surgery for every sort of degeneration out there. There's sometimes that you're 60 years old and that's just your hip. That's just life. And, and we want to prevent people from, from getting to that point. And to me, that's what respecting pathology is. It's like, listen, you have lower back arthritis. I think it's accounting for 50% of your condition right now. 
And if you're coming to me, there is 50% of your condition that I will be unable to fix. And that's respecting pathology. You probably shouldn't be deadlifting three times a week for the rest of your life. That's respecting pathology. If you have a hip labral tear, you probably shouldn't be an Olympic weightlifter anymore. You might want to do more lunges. We might be only be able to get your, your hip capsule adhesion to you know reduce 20%. So that is the magic of it. There are a lot of providers out there that will say, yeah, 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 yeah. arthritis doesn't matter. There are plenty of arthritic people that don't feel pain. This person had arthritis. I adjusted them three times. No more pain. Arthritis is, a, is not a, a, an immovable obstacle for me. And if they would have been well-versed enough or the patient would have been well-versed enough in the first principle, load versus capacity, you, know, you can adjust somebody's lower back and then just reduce the load enough to actually get them under that pain threshold and and that's a lot of times what happens is, 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 is you know hey for two weeks don't pick up anything off the floor i've reduced the load gone under the capacity i'm a miracle chiropractor yeah it's it's a bit unfortunate because that in that case that hasn't really taken care of the problem that got that person there in the first place um yeah, look, I think it's, you know, one of the things that I love about this, uh, the, the we do is that it's it's function-based. So we're, we're really looking at um, what's working, what's not, uh, what can be improved. And and that kind of reveals itself. We call it the, the thousand pound elephant in the room, right? Yeah. That's what I say. I say, listen, we're, this is what it, you have adhesion, right? You have mild adhesion adhesion we can expect mild improvement with the actual hands-on treatment now i'm going to provide you with some advice some lifestyle changes because you know that mild adhesion removal is only going to get us so far so now it's my job as a practitioner to think okay you have an fai or you have a cam pincer deformity or you have lower back degenerative disc disease what are the things that i know based on my expertise that will make that worse that i want you to manage that i want you to avoid okay you've got lower back degeneration probably shouldn't be sitting down for four hours at a time probably shouldn't be doing uh, you know, heavy deadlifts on Monday and then grace on Tuesday and then whatever, rowing 10,000 meters on Wednesday. That's probably going to light you up and there's nothing that a provider can possibly do in order to fix that. Um, so that's, that's where the, the second part of respecting pathology is. It's like, here's what we should work out, watch out for. Here is my honest assessment of what you can expect that's it yeah i think one of the big things i think is to that we actually <clears throat> move well away from the idea of non-specific um pain or diagnosis and that that sort of thing so if, if we are actually respecting pathology and respect in itself is I, you can sort of interpret that as as paying attention um so if we are actually paying attention to the pathology then it's not good enough to say that you have non-specific low back pain or it's not good enough to say that you have, you know, X syndrome. Um, it's lazy and we can do better than that. And we should be able to point to a tissue that is a tissue in lesion that is causing the pain or that has led to is involved in the problem. Um, you know, so that that's something that, that never sat well with me is the the idea of of back pain being non-specific. Um, you know, I've had a shitload of back pain, um, and I can tell you, it's it's not just non-specific. There's there's definitely stuff that pretty specific. <laughs> it is, yeah. Um, and it's you know it's a difficult puzzle, and it's a little bit like what you talked about earlier. This shit is not easy. Um, you know that that code to decipher it's hard, but. Uh, people deserve to have those answers. Yeah, because if you don't give it to them, who else is going to? That's the rest of their life in that body. Period. Like, holy shit, right? Well, you think of that, and it's like, hey, yeah, I can't sit here, look you in the face, and say I need to see 12 times and tell you that you're diagnosed 
hypnosis is mechanical lower back pain. Well, heck yeah, it's mechanical lower. The only time it's not mechanical lower back pain is if you've got a if you've got prostate state cancer and that's traveling to your lower back if you've got ankylosing spondylitis if you've got a metabolic diagnosable disease that i can take a blood test to now all of a sudden you don't have mechanical back pain mechanical back pain is a horseshit diagnosis so within that mechanical lower back pain is a degenerative disc disease which levels is it degenerating at is it sclerotogenous pain referral is it a disc irritation, you know, you've got an interferential tear. What is the reason where it's going on? Maybe it's not even your lower back. Maybe your lower back's just pissed off and overloaded because your hips don't move. Maybe your upper back doesn't move. Who the heck knows? Maybe you squat. squat a lot of ability sucks and that puts a ton of, mo of, of load on your back. So it's, mechanical is garbage. If you're listening to this and you've ever got the diagnosis of mechanical, mechanical leap it has to be a specific tissue with a, a, a group of levels or a group of tissues and the actual um, pathology that's causing it is it is it adhesion is it a degenerative disc is it a herniated disc is it a, a you know what is it is it you know do you have l5 s1 what is it you know yeah yeah completely agree you know, yes, I do know. Yeah, yeah. Look, <laughs> this uh, is like pre this is preaching to the choir right here. This is definition of preaching to the choir here. Two people who already share similar worldviews. Right, but uh, unfortunately, I think um, it's probably the minor minority in a lot of cases. You know, I I, I remember being told once that I had uh, at one point piriformis syndrome. I mean, what the fuck does that mean? Yes, yeah, as, as a general rule, sy syndromes are not diagnoses. Syndromes are, uh, are, are are symptom patterns. So piriformis syndrome is a symptom pattern. Uh, I syndrome is is a symptom pattern. So uh, that's an incomplete diagnosis. Anytime carpal tunnel syndrome, right? Incomplete diagnosis set pattern. Yeah. There you go, mic drop. Look, it could. There's so much that can be involved in that. Um, you know, in the end, I sort, I figured out at least uh, there was definitely there was adhesion involved, and that's and not at the piriformis muscle, by the way. But it's um, you know, adhesion's not going to be the the culprit in everything. It might be involved in a lot, but uh, yeah. Look, I think it's easy to kind of. Um, almost hide behind some of these ideas and say, yeah, you've got piriformis syndrome, you've got a, a an SI joint sprain. Uh, I don't know. We could go on forever, but it's um, it's not good enough, is it? <laughs> yeah, and then and then you have to take a look at okay, am I if a, a third party insurance company is going to compensate me based on your diagnosis? based on a set of data that lets them know that a certain diagnosis requires a certain amount of visits, am I going to always be truthful in that diagnosis? Hell no, right? Hell no. If you can upsell a diagnosis and get four more visits, you bet your ass somebody's going to upsell that diagnosis and, and, and get four more visits. It's just that's just human nature, right? So you run into that. And, you know, if I went to an insurance company, even now, and this is part of the reason why, you know, I don't accept insurance is I can't go to an insurance company and say, listen, they have a sciatic nerve entrapment at the gemellus superior muscle. It's a grade three plus. How many of it's going to give me? They'd call yes, me and be like, who the Get out of here. fuck are you? They'd be like, what are you talking about? The old, yeah. the old retired chiropractor that works for the insurance company will be like, well, where's the subluxation? I can't help you if there's no sublux. So that's another reason why we don't do it in the traditional medical model is because the traditional medical model laughs at us. They they don't understand what's going on. They're not going to give us credit for this wonderful tissue specific diagnosis with beautiful functional data to back it up. So if they're not going to participate in what I do. I'm not going to participate in what they do. It just makes sense. 
yeah, and you sort of wonder if that's ever going to change. Um, probably not in our lifetimes, but it's it's really really hard to get to be good at that. Um, and you know, this is I'm very early in in this process of of getting there, and it's going to be a lifelong mission, I think, to get better at it and pursue, you know, the level that that I would like to get to. I don't think that's ever going to stop. Um, but it's really fucking hard to have all that information and to be able to put it all together and to to get that picture right, to be able to take someone's experience and translate that um, and figure it out. It is. It's hard. It's uh, it's a lot of information. It's a lot to process. Um, so, you know, it, it, on one hand, it makes you understand why why people want to take it an easier road or why if you get given that option, you don't want to take it because it is fucking hard, but it's the right way and it's what people deserve to have to get better. Yeah, and it's so dynamic too. It's constantly changing the, uh, the, the prognosis, how good you are at treating, how good you are at diagnosing. You know, at one point, in my career, I was just like, your straight leg raise sucks. I think it's going to take this long. Now I'm at the point where I can be very, very specific in terms of why it's stuck, where it's stuck. Um, and, you know, I may not be as specific to you as I'm specific to myself. You know, I'm not going to sit there and talk about the freaking Jamelis superior muscle, yeah. but I'm going to tell you that your sciatic nerve is stuck and I'm going to show you the data that I have to back it up. And I'm going to tell you how long I think it's going to take to fix. And then I'm going to tell you that it's just a, uh, uh, an educated guess. And, and, and I'm not sure you just, you've got to be that specific with the pathology because if you're not that specific with the pathology, it's impossible to respect. Um, and that's just a fact of life, right? You can't just sit here and be like, you've got bad leg. Now respect bad leg. It's impossible. You can't do that. You don't understand what's going on. Can I walk? Can I run? Can I squat? Can I deadlift? Can I double under? Can I do this part? So you, you have to be very specific in order to provide the quality intervention. And you have to be very specific in order to respect that pathology. Yeah. I mean, a quick example of disrespecting pathology. I mean, how many times have you had someone come in that's been treated for what appears on the surface to probably be a disc injury before uh, and the level of care that they've had in another setting can sometimes be as basic as being given a heat pack to put on the lower back um, in the clinic and that's pretty much the treatment and just to be told that they've got a muscle spasm that's, yeah, their ql is in spasm yep i mean that's dangerous that and it is because they go and re-injure it again and that's a progressive injury um it just it's complete disrespect for what's actually happened what's brought that person in um what is everything that's happened up to that point and why the hell do they have all of this muscle spasm in their lower back i mean I mean, you and I know that that's, that's pointing to something else underneath the surface and it's likely a disc injury, but maybe it's not. So that's why you had this process. But it's just sad that that exists um, and that people pay money for that. And because they haven't been exposed to something else, they think that that's okay. Um, it sucks. And, and they're less likely to trust us because of that. Just because we have we we are associated with healthcare. Well, the last guy that I did didn't do anything. What are you going to do for me? Well, how much time you got? Sit down, pull up a chair, grab a cup of coffee, and I'm going to sit here and tell you what I can do for you that that a heat pack was unable to. It's you know how many how many times you get somebody come in and they say, "Man, my hip flexors are tight. My hip flexors are tight. I'm spending ten minutes a day stretching out my hip flexor." You find out that there's the heat in the lower back there's degeneration in the lower back and that's why they're carrying that anterior pelvic tilt that everybody claims is a hip flexor flexibility issue and you sit there stretching it and you actually make it worse as you go into that back extension trying to lengthen that thing out and you're screwed you have you you haven't found the pathology at a level that is even enough for you to decide whether you want to respect or disrespect it 
right? You, you Something has to exist <laughs> to respect or disrespect it. And if you can't find anything that exists, then I don't know. We're into like some heavy metaphysical shit right now, man. Yeah, look, I think, you know, chiropractors probably haven't done themselves a lot of favors over the years. Um, but, you know, I think to me, chiropractic is, it's not defined by adjusting. Um, and it's interesting because I'm just on the tail end of five years worth of training in that system and it is defined by adjusting. <laughs> but I think in practice and what it should be defined by is to be managers of musculoskeletal systems and, and problems. Um, and so if adjusting was the way to fix all of those problems, then that's what we should do. But, you know, we know that it's not, it should be about what's the, what's actually happening in this person and what is actually required to help them. And, uh, you know, that might not be with us every time. Certainly, certainly not going to be. Um, we're going to need input from other people as well. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's frustrating. I think that our, that profession is just seen as backcrackers um, and, and that's where you pigeonholed. And I, I think it would almost be better if they just changed it to uh, musculoskeletal doctors. That would be beautiful. But, um, you know, that's, uh, that's not going to happen in our time. That's a, that's a song for another day, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, that's, uh, that's probably a good way to the tail in this one today. So it's, it's, good, uh, it's, a good it's been a pleasure. Up. Yeah. I think yeah, we touched absolutely. on some good shit today. So uh, I enjoyed that. Hopefully, hopefully, the, hopefully the viewers enjoy it. Maybe we'll go from four to six this week. It'd be huge. Let's not get too carried away. But, uh, Let's not get too carried away. <laughs> All right, brother. I appreciate All right, man. you. Have an awesome yeah. day. Thank you, dude. I'll see you soon. See you.